thank you. For those who don't know me, I'm Scott Stern, the faculty director of the Martin Trust Center for MIT um, Entrepreneurship um, here, at, and I'm a professor here at MIT Sloan. I look forward to seeing many of you. I, I see many a familiar face. We're catching up after a long summer, um, and I, I hope to see a bunch of you in entrepreneurial strategy um, this spring. So welcome to the General George Dorio Lecture, an annual lecture um, established by the Carney uh, uh, family and down to honor the legacy and impact of George Dorio, the founder of the modern venture capital industry and a central figure in the development of the entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Boston um, after World War II. Today, I am just delighted and I will be brief to welcome our 2018 speaker in our second edition, Vinod Khosla. Um, I'm gonna dispense with a traditional introduction since you are here because you already know who he is, <laughs> okay? Um, his reputation precedes him, but also because one rarely has the opportunity in life to say thank you to a hero of yours. Um, a little known fact about Vinod is that he was the protagonist in an HBS case on the early days of Sun Microsystems, which he founded shortly after his graduation from Stanford GSB, my alma mater, uh, Stanford. When I was a junior faculty member, I was not a very effective instructor. Um, you can look, if you can get back to the 1995 teaching ratings, that will be confirmed. Um, with those fall off. And I was not by the, helped by the fact the cases that we were using at that time in our innovation and entrepreneurship uh, courses were just not very good. A friend at HBS, Amar Bidet, convinced me to try his great case on Vinod Khosla at and Sun. And well, the topic of the case wasn't that interesting. It was whether a small startup at the time could get a contract with a big player, computer vision in their industry. And to be honest, it was a little bit dated because Sun by that time was already quite successful and the case was kind of about the early days of Sun, so it was kind of 15 years old. But at a key moment in the case, the president of the big firm, Computer Vision, just looks at Vinod and right, you, uh, simply tells him that he's not getting the big contract and that Computer Vision has decided to go with Apollo Systems, the early leader at that time in the workstation industry. And then I went around and asked the students what they would do. And to be honest, your predecessors there two, 20 years ago really did a really poor job in coming up with a good plan, okay? There were some suggestions to find another customer which basically, that was a loser, given the facts of the case. There was no other big kind of central player like computer vision. There was sort of some suggestion you give a little bit of a discount. That wasn't gonna move the president of computer vision. I then had the students read the offer that Vinod made. He basically offered to move effectively half of his team in California here to Cambridge to basically work for computer vision to basically put people like Andy Bechtelsheim and Bill Joy to help Computer Vision build Sun Workstations branded as something for Computer Vision, allow them to brand the machines under their own name, and allow Computer Vision to feature the best technology in the industry. And when the president of Computer asked him, okay, I'll, I'll listen, what's the cost of your generous offer? He simply replied, in exchange for nothing. Literally, it was all going to be free. The students were floored, as was I when I read the case. Here you are, the CEO of a company, you have a bunch of investors, you're kind of running out of money anyway. How do you justify it? What happens if it doesn't work out? How are you going to explain this to everybody and how are you going to pay the bills? But Vino understood that the future of Sun, establishing Sun as one of the absolutely foundational companies that created the technology world we inhabit today depended on Apollo not getting the contract rather than Sun at that time earning a profit from that initial contract. Towards the end of the class, I gave my sum up. I remember what I said. This, my friends, is what real entrepreneurship is all about, having a crystal clear understanding of how you create value and then making tough choices that allow you to succeed in actually delivering that value in a meaningful way. What is the point of this story? The data will show that my teaching ratings dramatically improved that semester, which was very helpful, so thank you. Um, with many of the students actually pointing that case as a key learning and one of their favorite cases at Sloan. Um, I just wanted, I could go on, but I just wanted to welcome 
a, a real um, entrepreneur, um, inspirational investor, and an inspirational um, social thinker to MIT. Um, I want to um, uh, thank you to uh, thank you and welcome you to the General George Dorio Lecture and take it away. Thank you so much. Thanks. So keep track of time. Good morning, everybody. How many people want to be entrepreneurs? Good. How many people are technical? OK. Uh, and I have my clicker here. So this talk I'm giving you came about by me doing a fun exercise, I realized technology in entrepreneurship used to be about technology, sort of obvious. But then I realized that technology was affecting everything. So I did the inverse problem about uh, not last summer, but summer before I started looking at US GDP. And I asked the question, what part of US non-governmental GDP, we can come back to government, could we not reinvent in a way that was 100 to 1,000% more efficient? And I was shocked that there was no part of US GDP. And when you talk to people in automotive, in construction, in education, they talked about 2%, 3% improvements. When it was clear to me that there was a path to 100 to 1,000% improvement. So, oh, so yeah. that was the basis for this talk. And hence the somewhat pretentious title about reinventing societal infrastructure in a way which we can really afford to have all 7 billion people have the level of goods and services that the top 10%, the top 700 million have without destroying the planet. So I'll go through this very quickly. 700 million people have a rich lifestyle. How do we get 7 billion people to have that? That was the basic problem. And that involved in reinventing not, not just some narrow niche of society, all of society. And I think technology is the only bridge. That's why I asked how many people are technical. I'm a, I'm a technology optimist. I'm a technology bigot. It, OK. Um, it's the only thing that can multiply resources. A pound of steel is a pound of steel till technology comes in the picture. And that's, OK, it's a little slow. So almost everything can be multiplied, and I'll hopefully make my point. What's also true is, if I don't violate the laws of physics, if I can think of something, in almost every case, no matter how impossible it seems, one can actually invent that technology. This has been a surprise to me, and I'll give you some examples. All enabled by unreasonable entrepreneurs. There's nothing reasonable about being an entrepreneur. You have to be unreasonable, you have to be naive. You have to assume you can do a lot more than others can do. So that's sort of my basic thesis. It's the power of ideas driven by entrepreneurial energy. These clickers are always too slow for me. I, uh, Here's the other thing I want to know. Business schools tell you about business plans. They're completely irrelevant. Planning in innovative things is a bad idea. 
And the biggest mistakes you make are when you think you know an answer and can put it in a plan. So I always say, in plan to plan, but don't make a plan. A business plan is only useful to me in judging how an entrepreneur thinks, not in what they'll actually do. There's also this attitude question of why can you do it versus why not, which is very, very important. There's always a pessimist for every solution you find. Somebody will always tell you why it won't work. The other thing I want to say about Silicon Valley, it's, it's much more about a culture than a place. So what's this culture? You try things. You're not afraid of failure. You don't need permission. Yes, there's a lot of arrogance and hubris that goes with it, because if you didn't have that, you wouldn't attempt most of the things uh, entrepreneurs do attempt, and that's why I call it a culture, an attitude, a way of doing things, uh, and not a place. This comes back to this planning issue. If you start on a big project, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be going to Mars, as impossible as it seems. You just need to figure out the first few stepping stones. And for those of you more academically inclined, there's a professor at INSEAD who did a great paper called Effectual Reasoning that entrepreneurs do that's on our website um, uh, that uh, is hand marked up. I'd recommend reading it and why you don't want to plan the whole plan. It's also true that in addition to being able to invent almost anything you can think of, you can do a lot more than you think you can do. And most people, I find, are limited by their thinking, not by their capability. This seems like a platitude. But if you imagine an impossible task in small incremental steps, uh, then, you gain, uh, then you sort of make a lot more progress. So um, I hope you get a good sense of my view of the culture of entrepreneurship and the culture of how you do nearly the impossible. So back to the problem at hand. People always ask me what's, uh, what can be innovated, and I always say what can't be innovated, because there is nothing that can't. And that's why this exercise with the US GDP. Here's the other thing, which is my particular bias. No institution will ever innovate and that statement is much more likely to be right than wrong. It doesn't matter if it's an academic, for-profit, not-for-profit, it's General Motors, General Electric, doesn't matter. They cannot possibly innovate, and I couldn't think of one large innovation in the last 30 or 40 years that came, large innovation, that came from an institution, none. The closest one I could think of in the early 70s, Bank, Bank of America took its customers that they had already issued credit to and gave them plastic cards. That was the largest innovation and the most recent one I could think of. Think about it. And if you, some of you will come up with examples, and they're likely to be incremental innovations without a change in model, without a change in the way things are done. So give you a few examples. You'd expect space to be innovated by Boeing or Lockheed. 
not a chance. General Motors and Volkswagen, they helped the Department of Energy in the early part of this decade make a forecast for the number of electric cars in the year 2035. Tesla exceeded it in 2016. A 25-year-old forecast wrong by 20 plus years. That's the nature of larger institutions. So I can go on and on. I won't go through these examples. But almost nothing large has been done by an institution. And the only exception is founder-led companies. So Google is still founder-led. Now that I've laid out my biases, uh, this is the most interesting and thing that surprised me, that no part of the world GDP, the economically valuable activities, is safe from disruption, which is really all opportunities for all of you. And what has caused this to happen? Essentially, the tools we have for innovation have increased dramatically. And when the number of tools increase, the combinatorial possibilities go through the roof. When you combine some of these things, combinatorials of various technology, what's a combination of 3D printing and AI let us do, along with the cost of easy experimentation? For under a million dollars, I know somebody who's trying to 3D print with AI technology a whole house, a small house. As radical as it sounds, um, this low-cost experimentation instead of what might otherwise be a hundred or two hundred million dollar project at a large company would then take five years to justify. It would have to have stage gates, all of which is a terrible idea when you're innovating. Uh, so let me talk about some of these tools. And again, I won't go through them. But all of these are very, very powerful tools that are being combined in unusual ways to do all kinds of interesting things. And I'll go through these examples. And turbocharged by older innovations, and I won't spend too much time on these, but you know all these old tools. Keep track of time here. Um, so let me go through some of these areas. Imagine health in 2050. What might it be like? And I think it's going to be a lot sooner than 2050. A couple of theses. The patient will be the CEO directing their care, not the doctor. In fact, there really is no need for doctors in healthcare at all. I haven't found one good reason. The fundamental notion of medicine that you have a symptom and you diagnose will disappear. Symptom-based medicine is too late. If you have cardiac disease, it's a shame that in 2018, most people will discover it by having a heart attack. When the disease started 20 or 30 years ago, it's stupid. But that's how most people discover they have cardiac disease in 2018. So we restrict. You know, you go to your doctor, they have this test sheet, they mark up 10 of the 30 things. Your body has 30,000 biomarkers. We use 300 of them and third, three or 10 of them in any one diagnosis. Why? Because humans can't look at more data. If machines were looking at data, you wouldn't have three, you'd have 30,000. So, uh, many years ago, uh, it was actually about four years ago, Stanford was designing a new $2 billion facility. They came to talk to me about 
uh, they actually had their design firm and their CEO come to talk to me about how they should design the hospital. And I looked at their plans and I said, you're wrong by a factor of 1,000 in the amount of data you will have per patient and how you will do diagnosis. I talked to him about a year ago as the facility is opening. And I said, I was wrong by a factor of 1,000 because you were wrong by a factor of a million. <laughs> in the amount of data used to diagnose as simple as a cold or a sore throat. Think about that. Again, I won't go through every example, but the patient will make the trade-offs. If any of you have had anybody close go through a bout of cancer, the first thing, if you have the privilege of getting an oncologist, they'll ask you, do you want an aggressive oncologist or a less aggressive one? That's a stupid question. That should be the patient's choice in fine-grained trade-offs. So I won't go through each of these. We can, uh, in question and answer, come back. But I do believe, and human doctors cringe when I say that, the idea of symptoms to diagnose disease is a silly one. Because long before that, there's chemistry in the body changing. There's imaging in the body changing and there's phenotypic behavior patterns that are changing. You breathe a little heavier, you walk a little slower, your gait's a little, you know, 10 years before you know you have Alzheimer's, you can tell you have Alzheimer's from your gait, how you walk. Those are the kinds of things I mean. The other promising thing is once you eliminate doctors, from doing diagnosis, because they can't handle the amount of data. Then the cost becomes virtually zero. So again, I won't go through details, and I could give a one hour talk in each of these sub areas. Uh, but you can see where science is going. I'll put these up. I won't talk to them. I'll talk about a few isolated examples. Ginger Io started off at MIT, started uh, out of MIT Media Lab because they were looking at the number of suicides among freshmen at MIT. Turns out it's a diagnosable problem through biomarkers that are digital. How, people, how somebody uses their phone is indicative of their mental health state you can predict hours in advance, something a psychiatrist can't, that this person is going to be manic depressive or bipolar or pick your favorite mental condition. And all of that talk therapy can be done by an intelligent AI agent. This particular one, in something that sits in the Apple Watch, it can diagnose your blood potassium level hyperkalemia to take a blood test can be life-saving because potassium is a key variable in cardiac death. I won't again go through all of them. The level of diagnosis some of these people are doing, discern for $50 is trying to get 30,000 biomarkers from a dyed blood spot that you don't even need a phlebotomist to draw blood for. You can finger prick and do 30,000 biomarkers. So you could actually do a test every week when you're not sick, so you know in advance when you're getting sick, for far less than one Quest blood test. These are other examples of looking. My favorite one uh, is CureI, which my son's doing. It's not my favorite because my son's doing it. My son's doing it because it was one of my favorite ideas, and I convinced him to do it. <laughs> It's building an AI primary care physician. So all 7 billion people on the planet can have a free 24-7 primary care doctor they can text with, who can read their skin rash photograph, can diagnose a blood test, prescribe a blood test, read an x-ray, all over text messaging, which all 7 billion people on the planet 
will have access to. I love these kinds of things because they completely change the equation of how you deliver primary care. But there's many others like that. Bay Labs doing ultrasound in a way that doesn't need either the ultrasound technician because the AI tells you how to move the probe, the AI technician's moving, and it does the diagnosis, which a radiologist would have to do. It eliminates people, makes it instant. Even drug design, these are two companies in Toronto doing drug design with just AI. The wet lab part, testing them, they just contract out to a contractor. Transportation in 2050. I'm going to try and move a little bit faster. It'll be carbon minimal for sure. But I actually think, just like we think we can eliminate most humans, and I don't mean all humans from prior medicine, there is a 20% that will be just be the human interface. Only the human element of care is likely to be done by humans in medicine. Not diagnosis, not prescription, not testing, not monitoring. And today, your average hospital for every care provider, there's 14 other people involved. Uh, that's how much overhead there is. Same thing happens in transportation. I actually think. In 2050, the car industry will be as obsolete as the mainframe industry is today. I would be shocked if the number of cars don't decline by more than 80%. And each vehicle, and I don't call it a car that's used, is used 10 times more often. So the effective transport capacity in passenger miles will go up. Every pound of steel, my beef today, to carry a 200-pound person, at a minimum, you're using 2,000 pounds of steel. And that 2,000 pounds of steel carries a 200-pound person for 12,000 miles a year. I think we'll have 200 pounds of steel carrying a 200-pound person for 120,000 miles. That's how you dematerialize society. And by the way, public transit will be like Uber, point to point, because the single biggest component, why you go to bigger buses, why in London you go to double-deckers, is because the expensive part is the driver. If you don't have a driver, your public transport vehicle will be on demand, point to point, mostly getting privileges of private lanes in cities at a dollar cost, far less than it costs today to provide public transit. So that's the kind of reimagination I ask you to do. It's silly to have trains be that long. Why? Because they need a driver. If trains were on demand on tracks and they were autonomous, didn't need a driver, they'd be four-person parts. Whenever you need to walk up to the station, you get one. And of course, the number of flying vehicles I've seen in the last year blows my mind that I've actually seen flying personally. Uh, of course, Elon Musk's talking about San Francisco to Shanghai in 30 minutes on a rocket. Uh, who knows, but I don't discount the possibility. He can rationally explain how this works. And when you do this kind of transportation, what is commute distance, which is generally about 30 miles, uh, 30 minutes, will expand dramatically which means it dramatically impacts housing density, housing costs, and other things. So what's going on? Lots of, again, axes of innovation. I won't spend too much time on it. Free taxi services, flying cars, rockets. Let me 
go on and talk about housing. And I'm purposely picking areas that you don't think of one more Snapchat, one more quick software thing, which is easy to imagine as a startup. These are things people tell me can't be changed. I do believe we can get to at least 50 and maybe an 80% reduction in the amount of materials that go into a building like this or in the house you live in. Think of the amount of mining we do for cement, steel, copper. We could reduce it 80%. That's not only possible now, I think it's very likely. And this is why all those valuation calculations are completely irrelevant because they rely on 20 year forecasts that don't work. Power plants are amortized over 50 years. That sort of, that kind of notion of financial analysis will be rendered obsolete. We can come back to this if you have time for questions by what, what we'll see. So densification and dematerialization are just some of the things. And I'll give you some examples of why this is this combination of axes of innovation. But uh, you can sort of see how city design would change. So we just funded our first YC startup, which is designing a city with no cars. We change cities to accommodate cars. Now that we don't need cars, how would you design cities again? So we just funded our first startup in that area. I like the idea of something as fundamental as rethinking city design. And this is particularly important in the developing world there's a, where there's a mass migration of people from rural areas into urban areas, a little less so in places in the West. But even in the West, I think you'll see, if you can fly to a, a location 100 miles away in 15 minutes, and that's your notion of commute, and it costs less time and money than a car commute, then you might actually think of real estate differently. Again, lots of axes of innovation, and I'm skipping past this because there's actually a 50-page paper I published in Medium in April that I'm actually revising right now that you can get the details in. I want to give you a sense of what's possible here. This is a little company here. So this little thingy is like transformer toys. Literally, the bed can fall. Uh, they asked a simple question, why do you need three feet of space in front of a closet other than for 30 seconds in a day when you're pulling out your jacket? So they have robotic furniture that actually eliminates that space except when you need to get your clothes. And when you need your clothes, the bed goes under it and the two parts open, you actually get a walk-up, walk-in closet in 400 square feet of apartment. They actually have one Airbnb unit somewhere here in Boston. I love the idea of multiplying space with a simple idea like this. Um, they, they, they're doing a bed that falls out of the ceiling. Why would you use that space during the day when you need desk space or living space? This machine, this restaurant is open in San Francisco, has all the output capability with zero labor of a full McDonald's restaurant, which is generally sized at 150 to 200 burgers an hour. And instead of having 20 people in the kitchen, they have none, and the machine fresh grounds your beef in front of you, fresh slices your onions, fresh slices your tomatoes, and customizes your sauces. And it looks like something you want to eat from. 
It's a beautiful experience. But restaurants are a big part of any urban landscape. If you can change this footprint, you suddenly change. And they're empty most of the time. Other than at lunch and dinner, they're mostly empty. Could you make space much more efficient? Could you provide very low cost? Their cost of a burger is less than that for McDonald's, even at tiny scale. Why? Because they've eliminated the two largest costs. CapEx in a restaurant, which is about a million and a half to equip a McDonald's restaurant, and all the labor. And I just came from a restaurant in Boston called Spice that's doing something similar. Robot deliveries. This is the house that this startup is trying to print this year. 3D printed, far less material, a day's worth of construction. Spaces for the plumbing and all get printed in while you're printing, not added later. They're still experimenting, but in 10 years, this would be doing six-story buildings, multifamily apartments, if it works. Manufacturing, again, dematerialized. I'm almost certain that nobody would want to manufacture anything in China. The lead times are too long, the supply chains are too long, the amount of money in inventory is too much. When you can customize to demand within 24 hours and get it delivered. So we are, I have a daughter who's playing around with designing, printing, and delivering custom furniture within days not the six months it takes to buy from your local design shop and they get it shipped from Italy or China. And this is sort of this notion of completely rethinking the supply chain. If assembly line robots cost a dollar an hour, China's way too expensive. What would happen if all of you thought about re-inverting the supply chain? And I'll come back to this notion of generative designs in just a minute here. But you get the idea. I'll give you some examples. Again, lots of axes in which innovation's happening. So these aren't just ideas. They, they actually have details on how you use each of these components assembled in unique ways and build a new business model around it. Um, Actually, Shiri Robots is a really good example. If you've seen an assembly line robot, it has to be so precise if it's welding a joint on a car. Um, the end has to be sub-millimeter precision. So they build this heavy structure, three tons of steel, and massive motors moving three tons of steel, all because you want your paint or your weld joint to be sub-millimeter precision. If you built shitty robots that actually were floppy, but used AI to localize it to the exact sub-millimeter precision you need, it's a much better way, an order of magnitude cheaper and dematerialized. So Vicarious is building assembly line robots, and their goal is you can rent one at a dollar an hour and do anything on the assembly line. And their goal is just like a human, this is the big problem with robots today, why they do it in China. Once you set up an assembly line and you want to change to something else, it takes three months of programming. They just want to have a human do the task a dozen times, and then the robot knows is already programmed how to do it because of AI. It learned. You didn't tell it. You didn't program it. That's cool. 
Uh, I just visited Berkshire Gray, completely reinventing every part of the supply chain. I won't talk too much about it. Every part of manufacturing in 3D composites, the cost isn't in the carbon fiber or the epoxy. The cost is all the hand layout it involves. If you 3D print carbon composites, wow, you eliminated almost all the cost disadvantage composites have. In every part of manufacturing, whether it's polymer printing, uh, what is called investment casting, which is very high in manufacturing, all of it being replaced by 3D printing. This bike, this mountain bike, should be on the market next year, 3D printed in composite, cheaper than titanium bikes. And that shoe is customized to each foot. By the way, the shoe most of you are wearing took 17,000 liters of water to produce, the one you're wearing today. And the EVA sole on it will last a thousand years, it will not degrade. We can make these recyclable. This is generative design where you actually take out material to make the product both cheaper and better. In 3D printing, the more comp complexity comes for free and you can change everything from a spanner to a bicycle and do it differently. Food and ag. Same thing happening in this space. And how are we doing for time? I should try and finish up. Um, I won't go through all of this. People told me food and ag can't change. Red meat production is as large a carbon footprint as all cars, roughly, order of magnitude. Lots of you know, axes of innovation. This product is 90% less land than beef production. How many of you have had the Impossible Burger? Oh, that's good. The rest of you will have it. Uh, I find it indistinguishable from beef. 90% less land for a product that accounts for 30 to 50% of this planet's usable land area. Think about it. So one product can completely change land use patterns in the, on the planet. 80% less water, 80% less carbon emissions, far less land. I can go on and on. This particular company, John Deere, just bought it last fall from us. I hated them buying it, but they offered a good price. <laughs> I couldn't convince the founder's wife she should forego $30 million in cash. <laughs> uh, the practical realities but it can eliminate herbicides from agriculture. Why? Because the machine, that little machine as it drives, has images every plant, decides what's a weed and mechanically weeds it so you don't need herbicides. If you could eliminate herbicides from agriculture, how big a deal would that be? And insecticides and then do plant by plant nutrition and care in a field with a million plants. Not possible with humans. Vertical farming, crop optimization. Um, let me give this example and then try and stop. So one of well, one of the things that drives me why I convinced my son to do primary care doctor because I think everybody should have access to the best doctor. But I also think everybody should have access to the best lawyer, 24 seven for free. An AI lawyer is high on my priority list of things to do. <laughs> so everybody can have fair access to the legal system, fair financial services. Everybody can have a free wealth advisor. Today, at the very high end, if you have a wealth advisor, 
It's somebody in a suit who delivers something a machine came up with. Let's skip that step. But all these financial services can be made accessible at almost no cost. So I keep focusing on how to give all 7 billion people what 700 million people on the planet have. And do it economically as great business ideas. So all this will happen. Even does overdraft protection for hourly employees. If it's this raining this week, somebody won't make their rent check next week because they got fewer hours, because fewer people went out for dinner. That's a solvable problem at very trivial cost. Even is doing that. You, you get the idea. This is one of my favorite areas. We just started, of all things, um, a fusion project out of the Plasma Fusion Lab at MIT. I'm so excited about this. People don't think fusion is practical. There's an international government effort that has a 50-year plan. They have a five-year plan uh, to prove positive fusion. So uh, obviously, automotive batteries, windows, responsive buildings, waste emissions into products, all these are possible. Um, Education's another thing that everybody should have for free. So my wife runs a nonprofit K through 12 education thing where all content is free. free. All the materials teacher need is free. But the next step, and anybody wants to work on this, call me. I want every student to have a personalized AI tutor so they can have a class of one that guides them what to do next, what to learn, to give hints when they're stuck. A personal tutor for every child on the planet for near free, and that's a nonprofit effort. That's sort of a dream, a dream of mine in education. Same thing. So I do think the same thing will happen in entertainment and consumer services. Uh, I do believe by 2050 we can eliminate the need for work. People who want to work will work, not people who need to work. Elder care is another one uh, my family is working on. Robotics is the only solution. And assisted care homes and others are just a terrible way to park our elders. For anybody interested in that, read Atul Gawande's book called Being Mortal. The key is 90% chance of failure is a very high chance of success if you're working on something transformative. People think it's a bad idea. I think it's a great idea because you have a 10% chance of changing the world. Again, it's a culture and attitude thing. And it is rewarding. It is impactful. Let me stop there, and I, I went a little longer than I planned, but open it up to questions. Like three or four questions, so okay, how about Peter, do you want to? Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that you talked about in your presentation a lot was sort of human wages as overhead, right? So we're sort of taking the human element out of a lot of these companies in order to make it much more efficient. What do, would you say is the role of tech or just industry in general to making sure that people still have a good quality of life? That, th even so if they that's a very bad view of the technophobic people. <laughs> no, it's true. All this is for a very clear purpose, the service of humans and human goals and objectives. And eliminating some of the base, more base features of humans. 
needing to steal because they don't have a minimum standard of living? Can you fault somebody for stealing if they have to steal for food? Right? We can eliminate that and give humans truly the freedom to do what they want. Now, where all this leads, it's not predictable. But almost certainly, this is not a society where technology rules. Techn I think technology serves. And we get to decide the goals. One more question. I'll let you pick. <laughs> Um, so thank you for the presentation. Um, I found the sort of this gap between 700 million and 7 billion like really interesting. Um, and so my question is more in regards um, that spectrum of that gap seems pretty wide. Is there a specific focus you have on like how you're looking at companies that are touching that wide gap to get to that 7 billion? Because I feel like you can start from the bottom or right after those 700 million? So I'm not sure I fully followed your question, but let me try and answer it anyway. I have this bad habit. Uh, the way we look at the world is we're not doing any of this. Entrepreneurs are doing all of this. I give a talk like this. I hope one of you will be motivated to take one of these ideas and say, let me, I like that idea. Let me investigate it. Let me propose it. Let me build a team around it. And to the extent that I've motivated one person to build a team here, it's a useful use of my hour. That's how I look at it. But we don't do any of this. And if you want to get motivated, and somebody here motiv gets motivated on any of these topics, then my jo job is to help them think better about it, help them form a team, help them get funding, help mentor and guide them. That's what I called my role. So when we started our firm in 2004, we didn't call it venture capital firm. We called it a venture assistant firm. So my job is to be an assistant to any entrepreneur who wants to pursue one of these visions. OK. I know there's tons of questions, but also I know that we are at our witching hour. So I just want to thank you for really an inspirational talk. Thank you so much. Thank you.